What's up, everybody? Welcome to Sit Down. I'm DJ Sixsmith. Cobra Kai Season 2 is here. Josh Shield, Hayden Schlossberg. Guys, how are you? Thanks for having us. Feeling great. Hey. You got it. So, we were just talking off camera. TV has changed tremendously since you guys have been in the game. And here you are with Season 2 of a show that is something that people fell in love with in the 80s. You guys bring it back in a fan fiction-y type of way. So, Josh, let's start with you. How did this whole thing come together, and how have you seen the industry change? It's so funny. You know, John Hurwitz, Hayden Schlossberg, and myself uh, have been friends for over 20 years. We bonded in high school and college over things like The Karate Kid, and we all ended up having separate screenwriting careers. Mm. Uh, I went off and did the Hot Tub Time Machine movies. They did the Harold and Kumar series. And we always kept coming back to Karate Kid <laughs> in our discussions and our love of film and our love of that story. And as streaming has kind of taken yeah. over this ability to do a long serialized story with uh, any subject matter whatsoever, it became more and more likely that something like this could hit. But it was really when we started seeing shows like Fuller House right. um, and, yeah. and stories like that that it felt believable that we could re-enter this world and that there was a whole audience out there that would be eager to uh, to go on this journey with us. Yeah, it's crazy. What's old is new again. So for you, Hayden, what was it about Karate Kid that you loved with these guys back in high school? I don't know. I think when I was a kid, it was just the ultimate underdog story. Mm. It was Rocky for kids. Right. So you fell in love with it for Daniel LaRusso and the relationship with Mr. Miyagi and karate was just, you know, awesome. You know, it had a climactic, you know, <laughs> tournament sequence. But as we got older, like as we got to, you know, college, we started to get really into the Cobra Kai's. Mm. We were into the bullies. They were just really colorful characters. They had different colored leather jackets. They, you know, rode on motorcycles and they were a karate gang. And that was just, we always <laughs> joked about like, how you know, everybody deals with tough situations in high school. But Daniel LaRusso had to deal with a karate gang that, you know, that That's a pretty tough thing to go against, yeah. So we just, there's something just always amusing about Cobra Kai and that there was this like dojo in the valley that mm. was just training bullies. <laughs> and obviously like bullying is still, you know, a really relevant topic today. And we, we actually like, as we put our heads together, we're like, you know what, you can actually say something today using these characters totally. from the past. Yeah. And along the way, I have a lot of fun, you know, callbacks. So what were some of the challenges that you guys faced in, in serializing this story and taking it to places that it hadn't been before? We had to really invent a lot of new story for mm. some of these characters. I mean, we knew from the original movie that Johnny Lawrence owned a motorcycle, right. was in Cobra Kai, uh, had a bad teacher, and uh, ultimately needed to be defeated at the All-Valley Tournament. But when we entered season one, we didn't know a heck of a lot about what made a guy like Johnny Lawrence tick, mm. what turned him into being that kind of hyper-aggressive, jealous, uh, bully figure in that movie. And that was some of the, uh, the really enjoyable part of launching this series, was to fill in some of the blanks in terms of what makes a bully tick, and how can you start to empathize with what somebody else is going through. And that were, those were the challenges that we enjoyed mm. going through in terms of building more story that supports the original material and doesn't challenge the original material. We weren't saying, oh, that actually wasn't Johnny Lawrence, right. it was a whole different guy. Like, we want viewers to be able to go back in the way that we love the movie and look at that and it still is the same movie. It doesn't, uh, it doesn't feel like these are taking place in two different worlds. Uh, but it was uh, just a really enjoyable challenge to take on. Yeah, definitely. And I thought well, another interesting thing from what I watched is like what you guys were able to do with the kids. It's like you have the bullying between John and Daniel, but then here we come in with all the kids and then just like writing for teens. Like how did you guys sort of harness all that going on, Hayden? Well, I think, you know, one of the things that's another thing about the original Cardi Kid that's, um, you know, that we connected to was it was it was a teen 80s, you know, melodramatic, mm -hmm. you know, love story. I mean, the, totally. the rivalry is all about Ali. And mm. so, um, you know, we we see a ton of, you know, these types of, you know, shows for young audiences today that are different variations of the same thing in terms of, you know, love triangles in high school. I mean, like the idea of doing that, throwing the karate element into it. Because um, <clears throat> you never really got to see Johnny and Daniel in high school, in, like what that high school show would have been. And this is sort of what that is. It's, it's a story where karate is a big thing in, in this school. <laughs> yeah. And it's which side are you on? And it has all the same, you know, kind of storylines that, you know, a fun, soapy teen show would have. 
and when you throw the karate into it, it's it, it kind of becomes like you know uh, this. It takes it to a crazy level. Oh yeah, a whole different level. So to have it here in 2018 and 2019, like it just must be hilarious for you guys to think like these same 80s principles are still here today, just in a different way. You know? Exactly. Well, yeah. Well, that's the fun is like seeing the the no mercy, the strike first, <laughs> yeah. the strike hard, the headband. Yeah. You know, seeing the anachronism <laughs> of of Johnny Lawrence having these stuck in the 80s uh, elements oh, yeah, about his personality. Absolutely. Even like stuff with Facebook and the phone and stuff like that, oh, yeah. you know? Or just like, like you said, just like empathizing with him a little bit because he was like, you know, persona non grata, like the number one villain you'd put on the list. And it's like, wait, this guy actually is a human. He has feelings. So it's, it's really interesting. Well, that was, that was, I mean, in a lot of ways where the premise of the show came from. Everybody, you know, has somebody in their high school that they thought was mm -hmm. just like a bully, you know, and then when you get older, you look back and you wonder like, what happened to that person? Right. And why were they that way? Yes. And you realize, wait, that's actually a human being that maybe <laughs> they had issues going on, which is why they were, you know, uh, that way. Or maybe you were just such a spaz with your, you know, mm -hmm. your, your underwear was out of your pants and you just needed to get that wedgie. But like, <laughs> I, I think, you know, with Johnny, you see that, oh, now I understand where all that like aggression came from. You know, it's it's coming from his sensei. And so in this show, you start to empathize with him and it just it blows your whole world because you're just so used to David and Goliath. Mm. And now we're telling Goliath's story. It's, right. And then fun. not having Mr. Miyagi in the picture too, but kind of flashing back to some things there, you know, I'm sure that was interesting for you guys to kind of play around and say like, all right, how much of this are we going to actually incorporate? It, it's, it's always a balance in terms of whether we're reaching for nostalgia mm. to make ourselves feel good or whether that nostalgia is actually supporting the, the story we're telling as we're moving forward. I mean, a big part of the, the story for Ralph's side of the story for Daniel is the absence of Miyagi. Mm -hmm. So we needed to make Mr. Miyagi's the void of a Miyagi-less world feel impactful. And sometimes that impact is felt with Daniel talking to a headstone. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's actually a, a flashback moment where we're able to draw upon the goosebumps and the, the moment of uh, the parallels between his life as the student under Miyagi and his life as this teacher trying to be his, uh, his mentor and his father figure in a way. And it's always a balance in terms of do we do too much? Did it become a little bit too, you know, do we put too many, mm. you know, maraschino cherries and, uh, and <laughs> you know, and chocolate things on the Sunday? Uh, and we're, you know, because there's three of us, we're always mm. calling each other. You guys can, yeah, balance each other out. Into question, yeah, is, yeah. That, is that a bridge too far? Yeah, even in some of the stuff I've seen in season two, it's just like the wax on, wax off at the car dealership or like the Medal of Honor appears. So just like little subtle things, yeah. maybe even better, Hayden, in terms of like just hitting somebody over the head with it. Well, sometimes, it, I mean, we just tell the story, and when you are telling a story with those characters from the Karate Kid, Karate Kid things are going to just naturally come up anyway, no doubt, so yeah. let it come up naturally and then don't force it. That's yeah, we like, we like to think of it as that, you know, there are three movies with, uh, with Ralph mm -hmm. and uh, Pat, and those movies serve as the real story of his life up until that point in his life. So we're, we're kind of reaching back into the photo album of what really happened to Daniel LaRusso. So it's amazing to have that material. It's Absolutely. amazing to have footage yeah. that has never aired that we're able right. to put in the show. And we use it as another show might, you know, do a flashback to season one and season three. You know, we're doing a flashback to, you know, season, you know, 1984. Yeah, yeah. that's awesome. So how much convincing did it take Ralph and Will? Well, um, you know, I think we, we knew going into it that, I mean, we've been obsessed with Billy Zapka since we were in high school. <laughs> I, in some ways, we were put on this planet to, like, you know... Uh, <laughs> to bring him back. To bring, <laughs> bring him back into <laughs> national attention. Because uh, we've been talking about him, not just from Karate Kid, but his other movies. Right. So we, and, and so we had actually, when we started making movies, like, you know, in, for the second Harold and Kumar, you know, we wanted to get right. Billy Zapka yeah, yeah. involved. Um, and we, we, he wasn't able to do it at the time. When Josh made Hot Tub Time Machine, we got him involved. Right. Yeah, yeah, so I met Billy on the set of Hot Tub Time Machine, and you know I was just a Karate Kid fan Absolutely. who was in awe. Yeah. I mean, I'd spent the whole set working with you know Chevy Chase and mm -hmm. Crispin Glover and John Cusack, but it was Billy Zabka who walked in <laughs> that I suddenly became a little bit you know butterflies in my stomach That's about. That's hilarious. And we just bonded, mm -hmm. you know, over you know it was it was a not sharing my intense fandom at you know on beat one but uh but building up to it but and later on it's like hey by the way yeah hey by the way huge Love fan this. yeah and we just started so talking we, I about mean, it so we knew him a little bit okay. so we felt pretty confident that he would be game for sure. a whole show that that brings back his character and redeems yeah, it yeah no doubt um but you know our big yeah the big thing was ralph because not only 
did we, you know, we did our research and we knew that he was hesitant to, to come back to, you know, this role just because it was such a classic. Mm -hmm. why, why take the chance? Um, and also, I think we knew that it would be, we'd be seeing Johnny's side and be more right. sympathetic towards him. So what's you know, how's, what's Ralph going to think it's about... like, wait, the show's called Cobra Kai? Like, yeah. this is what I've been trying to fight my whole life, right? Well, I think, you know, we, yeah. sat, we sat, we talked, we actually flew out, you know, here to New York to talk to Ralph, um, and we were just, we, you know, told him everything we thought the show would be, and I think he just, he you can never know 100% what it's going to be sure. until you actually see it, but I think he had faith that we were fans that wanted to, you know, do something we kept saying this we want to continue the story we don't want to blow it up and make fun of it right well the yeah. thing that had happened over the years with karate kid is a lot of the elements of that movie became parodied mm. you had you're the best around that you know all of a True. sudden that yeah. song that was so earnest in the movie was used to you know in any parody of a sports montage yeah, and it, yeah. it started to take on this this silliness and the crane kick had been parodied so yeah. Whenever anyone had probably approached Ralph over the years, it was, hey, I got a great idea, you know, you're gonna come in, you're gonna do a crane kick, and it right. was probably just surface level, let's let's get that, you know, that low hanging fruit and remind the audience and hit him over the head with mm -hmm. Karate Kid, Karate Kid. And we were coming in with this very earnest, big idea of a show, um, and I don't know if he totally expected to hear what he was gonna hear from us because, you know, we're coming at him with our resumes of uh, you know <laughs> hot tubs and heralds and kumars and <laughs> yeah, exactly. no but you guys really did a great job of unpacking this whole story and just giving more because if it was just another iteration of the karate kid like he's probably not going to want to do it you know right. but this is something fresh it's different and you extend the story in a different way which i think is awesome yeah we had, we had to give him a reason to right. take the legacy out of that trunk um, that it was in and it had been resting and it was still intact mm -hmm. and we had to you know earn his trust with let us play with this thing right. and we promise not to break it. Yeah, I mean you guys like to play in many different ways. So let's let's start with you Hayden about your situation with Harold and Kumar because here you guys are writing a script and it turns into a whole huge thing. So how did you guys cut through and you know what was it like to put that whole thing together? Um, you know John Hurwitz and I, you know, we we were really young, basically just out of college, and we had sold a couple things already, you know, just nothing that had gotten made. Um, and we were in the, the grind of trying to figure out how to get your script, you know, produced. And there was all this pressure to have these high concepts or write something for a big star. At the time, we just wrote what was going on in our lives. Right. And we were two young guys living together, and we were, you know, what were we doing at night? Uh, you know, sparking something up and, <laughs> and taking some trips to White Castle. Yeah, and, and driving around <laughs> looking for late night food. And we grew up, you know, we just happened to have a lot of Asian Indian friends mm -hmm. growing up. We would always write Asian Indian characters in our scripts. Um, and so, like, the characters Harold and Kumar were always, like, on our minds. Mm -hmm. We thought, what if we give them their own journey? You know, um, it's not, you know, it's like I'm not a Korean American, I'm not an Indian right. American, but the show wasn't about that experience. Mm -hmm. It was really about, you know, a unifying experience of going for something that you crave. And um, it was just one of those things that we wrote like this is what our lives are like and it caught on and, you know, it was one of those cult hits, you know, at the time, kind of like a like an office space yeah. or dazed and confused and, you know, before we know it, a, you know, studio wanted us to do a sequel. We're like, <laughs> okay, yeah, this is awesome. And so we ended up just creating, you know, our own franchise, um, which is what's good about coming to something like a Cobra Kai because, sure. you know, we have experience having to, you know, okay, we've made this one movie. How do we up the stakes and make it even better for the fans and keep it going? And so that's the, some of those skills come into play when you you know go into multiple seasons of a TV show. Yeah, totally. And Josh, you see these guys doing Harold and Kumar. You have hot tub <laughs> time machine. So first of all, what was it like for you to see your boys having some success? And how did that sort of parallel into your thing, which also became a huge thing and kind of cut through as well? Yeah, it was great. I mean, John and Hayden and I came out shortly after uh, college to Los Angeles, and they found success immediately. Um, and we're able to sell a screenplay and another one and then get one made. Mm. Um, and, you know, I was kind of doing that climb yeah, yeah. and uh, a like, little bit like, turn? Yeah, yeah. That, why, why isn't it <laughs> as easy? Uh, but when you're fortunate enough to have a movie made and that movie is Hot Tub Time Machine, uh, you tend to appreciate uh, how special that is. No I mean, doubt. for me, it was the 80s. I grew up in that era as a kid. I was a fan of every movie in the 80s, highbrow, lowbrow, mediumbrow, nobrow. Yeah, <laughs> uh, but, but there was something about the ski 
uh, almost ski sexploitation mm. subgenre of 80s movies yeah, yeah. that was just magical as a kid. Uh, when I was, you know, 11, 12 years old, <laughs> there was, uh, you know, seeing the ski bunny with the, the snowsuit on the, the cover of the VHS box. Um, there was something very specifically silly mm. about that. And the idea of taking characters from, you know, now with a very 21st century point of view toward that culture and s plotting them, you know, right in the middle of that with all these 80s iconic actors uh, was just a dream come true to be able to go make that movie and uh, and to do a sequel and <laughs> yeah. uh, and the same thing you know who would have guessed that would become its own little franchise as well yeah it's really cool to see you guys both play on nostalgia and also stuff currently going on and that fits perfectly with Cobra Kai as well exactly. and what you guys do so when people check it out if they haven't seen season one if they see season two what do you want them to take away from this Let's start with you Hayden um, I think you know I think you said if they haven't seen season yeah, one. Yeah, if they haven't seen it, if they're just jumping in the show, or yeah. maybe they're they're pumped for season two. I just think, you know, you don't have to know the Karate Kid that well. Okay. It's like, do you know David and Goliath? You know, like, you don't have to read the Bible. Just well enough. You just have to yeah. know kind Wh which of... Which one's the, the big one? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's like, you, you just need to know that there was this tournament. And frankly, in the first episode, in the first two minutes, we kind of... It's pretty clear. Yeah. ...exactly what that backstory is. Um, it's really... I, if you're if you are a fan of Karate Kid, I don't understand why you haven't seen it already. Mm. You know, <laughs> it's, it's um, timeless. It really is. Yeah, you know, it's an '80s movie, but it doesn't matter. You can still watch it now. It's know? that's the thing. You know, I'll watch. You know, you know, uh, Karate Kid and Rocky were directed by the same director, mm -hmm. John Avildsen, and they're both those types of movies that are on every now and then, and you watch it, and you get sucked in, and you right. get invested, and those feels that you have when you watch these underdog inspirational like stories those are the types of feels that we're trying to you know put on the show along with a lot of comedy and you know action and so if you're going for that type of thing i, I would say there's not a lot of other shows that that provide that with like 80s mm. training montages yeah. <laughs> so you got to watch it that's gotcha that's how about you josh we write cobra kai for everybody uh it's it's if you're a diehard fan of mm -hmm. karate kid you will find things in this show that are just for you but if you're a fourth grader who stumbles upon this show you will get sucked into it just as well it's uh what we love is that there are parents watching this show with their kids and you know the parents are karate kid fans from the 80s and the kids have no idea mm. you know why their parents sat them down in front of this thing but there's teen soap opera happening in this show there is adult melodrama a lot of adult melodrama yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there, there is action you know it's it there is karate there is uh, there are things on fire at times mm. Uh, it is just one of those shows that has a little bit of everything and we're writing it for a very broad audience and we're telling a very earnest story about uh, about two people who have a, a lot of a lot of yeah. Uh, yeah a lot of distaste for one another but who are a lot more similar than they than they think and they're that far away from each other mm. but sometimes that far away can feel like miles and uh, we just hope to get to do this for a long time yeah it's a fascinating concept awesome show why don't you tell everybody where they can check it out you can see this show on YouTube Premium. Just go to YouTube.com, type in Cobra Kai, and let the platform do the rest. There you have it. Hayden, Josh, guys, thanks, thanks so, much. so much. Appreciate the time. Yep. Check it out, Cobra Kai Season 2 on YouTube. We'll see you next time here on The Sit Down.